Well, good morning. It's good to see most of you today. You know, some of the women have recommended that the men just wear masks all the time. So we're <laughs> over their whole head, yeah. Uh, but we're glad you're here this morning. If you're watching online, we're especially glad you're here. And um, I did want to say that our group is meeting at 5 o'clock tonight. If you want to come and check out our small group, we meet here uh, over in the uh, community center. Over in the community center. The old habits. I tell you, over in the family center next door. Uh, by the way, we have uh, UV lights in our um, uh, air conditioners here. We spray the building after you, uh, folks leave on Saturday night with peroxide. We have a, a thing that works kind of like a snowblower. You know the snowblowers that ionize the air? We have that. And by the way, in the winter, I'm going to see if it'll work. I'm going to try to. It's a snowblower. And I also have a UV light on the stage that's uh, moving some air, just so you know. By the way, if you're watching online, thanks so much for watching. And I appreciate, listen, Randy and Jill are out of town this week, and we have the power couple of the Coleman's back there running all of our equipment. <laughs> Eric is back there changing the angles of the and fixing lights this morning. And Cherie, who was my secretary for years and then got tired of me, is uh, really doing a great job too. So, so how's it going at the college, Cherie? You ready to come back yet, or are you good still? You good? Okay. <laughs> well, we're, we're glad you're there, and we're glad you're here. And uh, we have such a great group of people. Diane, who runs our office, Mike Williams, and uh, now he brings Josh in once in a while to make sure that we're behaving, and uh, we're not. But anyway, so today we're going to talk about being real in a fake world. Have you figured out that there's a lot of fake stuff, people, a little bit of everything in the world, and sometimes you can be deceived and not know it. So when I was a kid, now this, this is a, a remembrance of the 70s. Uh, and, and somebody told me that I had many 70s references last night. And I just want to point out that I'm getting old, and so that happens. But anyway, so this is my chainsaw. You can tell I've abused it a little bit, and I'm awful. I'm terrible about sharpening my chainsaw, which is a really bad thing. One of the guys who taught me, the guy who taught me how to Sharpen the chainsaw was here last night, and he said to me before he left, do you need me to sharpen that before I leave? I'm like, no, no, really, I'll sharpen it before I use it again. So when I was a kid, this will tell you how long ago it was, when I was in sixth grade, we went in Miami to a haunted house. Now, I want to just point out that I saved a girl's life that night. I just want to, here I am, Sally Isaacs, it was a spiral staircase, and everybody pushed back, and she fell over the side of the spiral staircase staircase and I grabbed her by her arm and pulled her back up. I just want to point out that I saved her life and she owes me. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. So, so at the end of this haunted house though, you would go down these regular stairs and it was dark and at the bottom, you ready for this? This will tell you how long ago this was. At the bottom, there was a guy with a chainsaw just like this just like this with a mask on and when you came down the stairs now this will tell you how long ago it was he would start it and push it towards you and even touch you with it. This is the 70s. Now, here's the difference. There was no chain on the chainsaw. So it sounded just as terrifying. And of course, you know, you're in sixth grade. You have no idea. But it was fake and not funny at all. If they did this today, people would sue, there would be uh, counseling appointments would be required. But this was the 70s. You used to tuck the seatbelts in the seats. You remember those days? And there were people arguing, we shouldn't have to wear seatbelts. The government should be in charge of protecting our freedoms, not our health, and all this. That just sounds so familiar today. Do you remember the arguments in the 80s? It was really funny. We'll be thrown free of the car if we're in an accident. That's much safer. People really, do you remember that? That was the argument. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm, this is a bad day. This said, Ernie, this could be really, you thought last night was bad. I'm already started bad. So here's the thing. When you're using a real chainsaw, number one, it's terrifying, especially when you put a new blade on. When you put a new blade on a chainsaw, there's something like, that's working great. And then you're also like, oh no. I would like all my fingers. And of course, my wife working at the hospital is like, oh, you know how many people we see a day? I'm like, oh, please don't. But here's what I'll tell you too. When you're using a chainsaw and it's working well, it, there's a smell to it that there's no way to explain. It just smells like cutting wood. But when the chain gets dull, 
It has a burning smell. It's a very different smell. And you can tell very quickly that something has changed. It's not working the way it should. Now, here's what I want to tell you. As Christians, oftentimes because we've been exposed to church so long, we have a hard time spotting people who are fake. Because the truth is, sometimes we have to kind of fake it till we make it, you know, in life, and we just kind of... But people who aren't believers, people who don't go to church, oftentimes recognize an authentic believer who really loves people very quickly. And if I can't say anything else to you, and if you need to take a nap in this service, I understand. But here's the deal. I want to encourage you today to be an authentic believer who takes time to get away and listen to God's voice through his word and in your heart and through his spirit. So today we're going to talk about three keys to growing as a real Christian. And we're looking at Mark chapter 7. And one of the things you'll see in this chapter is some people who are trying to please people. By the way, if you've never been exhausted before, try to please everybody. And instead of worrying about trying to please God, the people in the beginning of this chapter are trying to please people. And then later in the chapter, some people who are humble come before Jesus and ask for help. Now, I don't know about you, but I know that we need God's power in these days of uncertainty and frustration. Many of people have told me they're exhausted and frustrated and just grumpy. And we need God's power. And I don't want you to settle for a religion like Steve talked about earlier. I don't want you to settle for a religious exercise. I want you to really be able to dig into what it means to be an authentic believer. And so we're going to talk about being authentic. We're going to talk about asking. And we're going to talk about really paying attention. And these are the keys to growth. So let's start with number one. Number one, we want to have an authentic faith, not a religious show. By the way, time out for just a second. I know I'm taking a little extra time at the beginning. This message applies to you if you're a believer. But there are people who've come to church for years and maybe at one time were baptized or gave their life to Christ. And you don't know if you're saved or not. You don't know if you're a Christian or not. I want to encourage you before the end of this message... At the very least, when I talk about giving your life to Christ, to at least pray a prayer that goes like this, Lord, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not. I've been doing religious things, but I don't know if I really know you. God, I want to know from this day on that I've surrendered my life to you, that I've confessed my sins to you, and I have turned my life over to you, knowing that you died and rose again and can save me. Father, I receive that life from you. Because this message won't matter if you don't know if you're a Christian. So I want to encourage you to do that today. So here's number one. Authentic faith, not a religious show. We're picking up in Mark chapter 7. Here we go. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus. By the way, they were sent on a mission to basically trick him and trap him and figure out what he was doing wrong. That's always a good start, by the way. By the way, if you go looking for something wrong, guess what you'll find? Something wrong. I'll, I'll tell a story about me in a minute. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? By the way, they're not talking about not washing your hands here. It's not talking about that, you know, as Christians we shouldn't wash our hands. This is a religious washing, trying to wash off the germs of people who aren't Jewish. It was, it was about an egg and a half, and so you would do a regular hand washing, but then you would do this special religious washing. It was about, so you can imagine an egg and a half of water, and you would run it down your hands and arms to wash off the germs, because, you know, you might have been in contact with a sinner. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, you hypocrites. By the way, Jesus took that word out of the theater and applied it to fake believers. It was always a Greek theater word where, where people wore a mask, literally a mask, not a mask like you're wearing today, but a mask that would try to make you think emotions were different. And you've seen those people when you come to church sometime, right? How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God's so good. Didn't you just tell me that your dog died this morning? I know, but I'm so blessed. It's a small world. Out. I mean, they're just, they're just fake, right? Authentic. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be the other side of the person, too. Like, every time somebody talks to you, you're like, well, I just deserve what happened to me. All right? These people honor me with their lips, 
but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And what happened is they had the law, the Old Testament law, but now what they did is they added the oral law. And actually one of the last oral law teachers was the guy who taught Paul, Gamaliel. And, and so you've got these people, they added all these rules about everything, how far you could walk, how many steps you could take, who you could talk to, who you couldn't talk to, how you treated people. And the laws were, number one, crazy. But number two is they manipulated the laws so they could just do whatever they wanted. So if they got tired of taking care of their mom, they would just say, okay, mom, uh, I dedicate you to God. And then they didn't have to take care of their mom anymore when her mom got old. And here's what's amazing. They said, I dedicate that money to God. But it still meant they could spend it on themselves. Hmm, how convenient. And so when the rules fit them, suddenly that was the rules they liked. And so these were people who looked religious. If you saw them going down the street, they actually tied Bible verses on their foreheads. They had long tassels that they wore. And the more tassels, it was like patches for, for Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, right? The more patches they had, the more they were important. These people walked around, look how important I am. Years ago, I went to a church, I'll never forget, if you didn't wear a suit and tie... Uh, you got in trouble. And somebody came up and goes, you know, you're in God's house. By the way, guys, you know where God's house is in the New Testament? This is not the sanctuary. I know some people call this the sanctuary. It's not. You know where the sanctuary is for Christians? Right here. Right here. God's more worried about the tie and suit in your heart than he is on the one you're wearing on your body. You, you, can, you can dress up the outside and not be dressed up on the inside. The other thing, I was at a church one time, I'll never forget. this. I, I hadn't been there very long. I was on staff for the first time. The pastor baptized somebody. And when they came out out of the water, people were so excited, they started clapping. And the pastor stopped and said, how dare you defile this holy moment with your clapping? What? By the way, after he left our church and I was baptizing somebody. It was amazing how many people were excited to clap and get excited. What happened? He had made a rule he thought was important, which had nothing to do with what really was going on. And if we're not careful, we'll do the same thing. We sometimes make our preferences the rules if we're honest. Did you know most of how we do church now or a lot of way, things that we do have to do with how we live now? Every once in a while, somebody will come to me and go, Eric, I don't know why we have those lights on the stage and the music is loud. I wish we had first century church. And I'm a jerk. So here's what I say to them. You're right. We should turn off the air conditioning. What? Well, you want first century church, right? No, 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 no. I want air conditioning. Well, that's not first century church. Well, what do you mean? We turn on air conditioning culturally. It has, there's nowhere in the Bible that says to turn on air conditioning. Did you know that? So, so sometimes our preferences, we like a certain type of music. And by the way, the older I get, the more my preferences change. I hear songs on the radio now my kids listen to, and I go, what is that junk? And then I realize I sound like my parents, right? And so, and so we have to be careful that we don't put our preferences above what the Bible says. And instead of trying to reach people, we're more concerned with trying to be comfortable ourselves. If we're not careful, we will become a country club and not a church where everybody's welcome as long as they like what we like and do what we do. And how dare you make me uncomfortable by having a song I don't like. That's a country club. So he talks to them about their rules. And then he says, it says, after he left the crowd and entered a house, his disciples asked him about this parable. <laughs> by the way, imagine Jesus saying this to you. I, I can hear him saying this to me sometimes. Are you so dull? I think sometimes when I pray, Jesus is like, really? You don't get it yet? He asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. By the way, since Mark was writing what Peter was talking about, Peter was very excited about this whole idea. Because if you look in the book of Acts, Peter's the one who said all foods are made clean, which is crazy radical. I know to you, you don't think much about it, but you could not eat a cheeseburger back then. Because there's an Old Testament uh, law about, about the milk of the mother and the child being cooked together. And so they couldn't eat a cheeseburger, couldn't eat shrimp, couldn't eat 
bacon. I know. <laughs> he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy. The next word is slander. By the way, we tend to overthink slander. In Greek, this word basically just means hurtful speech. You ever said something? Just a little passive aggressive, maybe like me, you have some Italian genes and passive aggressive, just actually Irish genes. My wife has Italian genes. I don't know where that came from. You have Italian genes, you have Irish genes, so you do passive aggressive things. Or you have Italian genes and you just have aggressive genes, one of the two, right? Arrogance and folly, all of these evils come from inside and defile a person. See, too often we, we look on the outside and we think that's what spirituality is. But the truth is God knows our hearts. That's the good news and the bad news. I'll never forget years ago, I went to a church in Fort Lauderdale. And they started with a song that I would never play in church. And I didn't know the words. It was the song, Start Me Up. Which, you know, the, if you're like me, the only words to start me up you know is start me up. And so they don't sing the song. They just played the song. So you knew church was about to start. And I thought, this is a radical church. And so we walked into the service. I sat down in the service. And I'll never forget, in front of me, there was a basket going by. And I said, are they passing the offering before church even starts? And the pastor says, no, or the, the, my seminary professor was with me. And he said, no, 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 watch, look. He said, that's the cotton row. I said, what? He said, that's the cotton row. He said, they're passing cotton. This is where the older people who went to this church for years when they used to all wear suits and they used to play the organ and they used to do everything traditionally, that's where they sit and they pass cotton down the aisle and put it in their ears before church started. One of the ladies in that row later in the service, the pastor said, do you like everything that goes on, the church, goes on in church here? And she yelled, heck no. And he said, well, then why do you come here to church? And she said, because I love to see God change people's lives. She didn't care about the form or the style. She cared about what was going on in the heart. Do you see the difference? And during that church service, as I sat there, I'll never forget, the pastor said something that I didn't agree with. And I looked over at my seminary professor, who I really respected, and I said, I, I just don't agree with that. <laughs> he looked at me, and this is in the middle of church, by the way. What are they doing talking? He looked at me and he said, listen, don't miss what God wants to do by one thing you don't like. Now, here's what's awesome. By the end of that service, as I sat there, I realized, you know what? This is the kind of church I want to be a part of. Not because of the music. I don't want to start with the song, Start Me Up. I don't want to sing Beatles songs. They sing Beatles songs. I know, I know, I know they're good. But it was the authenticity it was people who were just being real and honest and striving to know God and love God. Not that they were just walking and doing whatever they wanted to do and calling it authenticity. But what they wanted was to see God move in their lives and the lives of others, even when it meant sacrificing their preferences for other people. Here's the first prayer. Father, I want to let go of my commands for yours. And we all have commands of our own, don't we? I mean, I have many on I-95. Thou shalt not drive in the left lane when the pastor is trying to pass you, right? Don't we have commands? And we do the same in church. We have preferences. Let's never put our preferences before God's word. Number two, asking earnestly for healing. And I love this passage because he refers to puppies. And my mom was never a dog person until she moved in with me. And now one day I came home, she said, I got a dog. I said, what? I said, I got a dog. I said, we have plenty. She said, I got another one. She has her own little dog. It's about the size of my hand. As dumb as a bag of hammers. We love him. He's just not smart. He's sweet, but he's just not smart. He can't always figure out how to get out of the doggy door. He runs into the bottom and then looks at it. Runs into it. And he still does that. This is not a smart dog. But I'll never forget, we were sitting at the table one night, and the dogs were sitting next to my mom looking at her. You know that look. And she said, can I give them something to eat? I said, Mom, you can do whatever you want, but once you do that, they will forever sit by the table. Just to tell you what happened, the dogs sit next to my mom every time she eats a meal now. And my mom looks over and goes, oh, there's no giggle. There you go, baby. There you go. 
That's what this verse is referring to. Listen to this. But they were trying not to let people know that Jesus was here. And it says this. In fact, as soon as they heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. Do you see the humility here? The woman was a Greek. Can we turn me down just a little? I got just a little ring and it's probably in my head, but... The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. Time out. Now, I want to tell you about this. This is important. This is not in the Bible by accident. The Syrian Phoenician women were known for being traitors, not traitors like Benedict Arnold. Traitors like they like to trade things. And, and the Phoenicians were known because they're the ones who brought us language. Did you know that? And if you go to the globe at Epcot, you'll see that because that's one of the as you go, I've been there way too many times. That's a great place to nap. Anyway, so, so the Phoenicians were the ones who would trade by water. And the women in that area, a lot of times, were very wealthy and owned their own businesses. Why? Because they were the, those who dyed cloth purple. And that was very expensive cloth, and they made a lot of money. But the women, a lot of times, had purple all over them. So a lot of people referred to them as purple people. Purple people leader. They, were, they referred to them as purple people. And so there was all this specific thing. And they were looked down upon because of how they acted, because of how aggressive they were. They were looked down upon. They were often called dogs. And she begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. And then Jesus says this. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Jesus basically shuts her down. Listen, I'm helping people who believe what I believe. I don't know that, you know, you're kind of on the outside. You're one of the little dogs. Instead of getting offended, listen to what she says. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Why do they eat the children's crumbs? Two reasons. You ever been a kid and not want what you had on your plate? If you had a dog, that was the best moment to ever have that dog. Number two is, even if you liked what's on your plate, if you had a puppy and you were a little kid, you just accidentally dropped crumbs on the floor. And so she said, Jesus, even the dogs get something. Then he told her, for such a reply you may go, the demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on bed and the demon gone. What happened? She earnestly asked Jesus for what she needed. When's the last time you earnestly prayed to God? When's the last time you prayed, God, would you change my heart? God, would you help my attitude towards this person? God, would you help me to forgive God, would you help me to walk in love? You know, the two main commands, love God and love people. I do the good and the love God when I think. And then there's people. And I have to sometimes say, God, would you help me to love so-and-so? God, would you help me with this person that's close to me that I struggle with? Father, teach me to pray in power, in spirit, and truth. I love it, what David Bernard said. He said, one of the greatest indicators of our own spiritual maturity is revealed in how we respond to the weaknesses, the inexperience, and the potentially offensive actions of others. It's easy to be spiritual when you're in your closet until you go out of your closet and you confront people. And I don't know if you're like me, but I can, I can be doing great and have my quiet time. And man, I've spent time with God and I'm on a spiritual high and I'm walking out and I'm singing spiritual songs and I've got amazing grace going through my head and I get on the road and somebody cuts me off and I'm not quite as spiritual as I was just a second ago. We need God. We need his presence in our lives. So authentic faith. Asking earnestly, number three, attention and obedience to him. This week, I was, or a couple weeks ago, I was teaching Elise how to drive. We go down this long road. It's about five miles, a dead end. It's five miles. It's two lane. It's a great road. Hardly anybody on it, but there are some people on it. So I'm teaching Elise to drive, and she's getting up to speed. And I say, Elise, I want you to go the speed limit. Now, I have to say that to myself sometimes, but on the other side of the speed limit. You with me? So at least going about 20 miles an hour, I go, honey, it's 35. You got to at least get close. I want you to learn how to drive. So she's going a little faster. She's driving and she's doing great. And all of a sudden, a four-wheel truck is coming down the road. And she starts to slow down. And she starts to pull where the edge of the road to the point that I can feel the bumps. on the. You know what I'm talking about? And so I have to, I have to reach up on the wheel and just push her over just a little, just a little. 
which is terrifying, by the way, if you're driving and somebody grabs the wheel. That's me. I said, keep going. It's okay. Now, here's what happened. She was driving, and she was doing great, and all of a sudden, she got distracted with something that came at her. Listen, you and I do the same thing all the time. And if we're not careful, we'll focus more on the problems of the world and the things we don't like and the difficulties that come and the things that happen to us than we focus on his presence. Here's what I want you to do. Listen, I want you to learn to focus like you do in a rainstorm when you're driving. Every Floridian understands that. You might drive like this all day long. And then all of a sudden there's a rainstorm and you are 10 and 2. And you got the windshield wipers going and you are doing this number. And nobody, you turn the radio down, right? You, you, every Floridian is like, yes. Listen, what if we paid attention when we read God's word like we did when we were driving? Listen, that's what happens next. So they bring Jesus a man who can't hear and he can barely speak. And it says, after he took him aside, Jesus took this man aside. He got him away from the crowd. You know he wants to do that with you? To heal you? Is there an area you're struggling with? Then get alone with God. Get alone with his word like you do when you're driving that car. Not alone with his word, distracted and listening to everything and everything's out here. But alone and quiet. Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears. You talk about obedience. I don't know about you. I'm not big on being touched. I definitely do not want your fingers in my ears. Now, if you're here and you like fingers, in, you don't. There's nobody here who likes. Nobody does. And what does Jesus do? Jesus comes to the guy and he goes, why did the guy let him do that? Why did the guy not resist? Because he was trusting Jesus. Listen, when you trust Jesus, you'll let him tell you what to do. You'll do things you've never done before. You'll go out of your way to be flexible and say, well, I'm going to do what you call me to do. But it gets worse. You think that's bad. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. Now you are freaking me out at this point, Jesus. But the man was so will wanting to be healed that he said, God, whatever you want. Are you at the point in your life that you're willing to say, God, whatever you want? Or are you saying, God, whatever you want, as long as you don't mess with me. God, whatever you want, as, you, as long as you don't mess with the way I like doing things, I will do whatever you want as long as I'm comfortable. If you really want to pursue God, you have to get uncomfortable. He looked into heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were open, his tongue was loosened, and he began speaking plainly. Jesus commanded him not to tell anyone, but the more he did, the more they kept talking about it. Of course they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. By the way, when God gets a hold of your life, your friends who've known you for years. Listen, you may be in church for years and be the most immature Christian in this room. But when you allow God to get a hold of your life, allow him to pull you aside, spend time in his word, let his word speak to you, let him change you, then people around you will go, that's not the same person. There's something happening in their life. And I've seen it time after time after time as a pastor. It's one of my favorite things. It's for people to say, hey, you know, I work with so-and-so, and they're a totally different person than they were. They were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. I want to encourage you to get away, get some time in prayer. Maybe use a, a simple acrostic like ACTS, A-C-T-S, adoration. Take time to praise God for who he is. Confession, take time to confess your sins, the areas where you mess up, maybe where you're struggling. T, give time for thanksgiving. By the way, I would encourage you anytime, take time for thanksgiving. Sometimes our attitudes are wrong because we're just not grateful. Let's just be honest. Sometimes we're just not grateful. We're sitting in air conditioning in Florida my grandfather moved to Florida in 1910. I wake up every morning and think, how did he ever? And then I turn the air down. We have so much to be thankful for. Take time to give thanks. And then finally, the S is for supplication. Pray for yourself, your needs, and pray for other people. By the way, sometimes our hearts change as we pray for other people. When's the last time you prayed for somebody you were struggling with? When's the last time you prayed for somebody who you saw had a problem? Instead of just talking about their problem, you prayed for them. God, would you help them to deal with this? Your final prayer is this. Father, take me aside and speak to my heart today. 
In these days of uncertainty and frustration, we need God's power, but I don't want you to settle for religion. I want you to settle for authentic Christianity where you spend time saying, God, I want to be authentic with you. I just want to be real with you. God, this is where I'm struggling. This is where I'm doing well. God, this is where I, my difficulties. I, I want you to ask in sincerity when you pray, not to just pray half-hearted prayers, but to say, God, this is really what's going on. And then I want you to get alone with him. Just spend some time with him. Be grateful, be thankful for all that God has done. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for watching online. My prayer for you is if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that this very day you would say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm messed up. I know that I'm broken. I know that I fail. And I want to surrender my life to you, knowing that you died for my sins, to pay for the sins I could never pay for. And you rose again so that when I surrender my life to you and I say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And some people use the word Lord. We don't know that word. It basically means to be boss. Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want you to be the boss, the ruler, the one in charge of my life. I surrender my life to you. Come into my life and change me. I encourage you, if you don't know Christ or you're not sure of your relationship with him, surrender your life to him today. And then I'd love to talk to you about what it means. How can I grow? How can I take that next step as a believer? Because as you do that, authentic faith flows out of an authentic relationship with him. And that's my prayer for us as a church and my prayer for you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, thanks for everyone that's here, everyone that's watching. Lord, I really pray right now that we could be authentic, just real. Lord, when we mess up, we just be honest. When we get it right, Lord, we just thank you for the grace you've given us. Help us to pray sincerely. Not just words coming out of our mouth, but prayers from the heart. And Lord, I pray too, there's some times that we just need to get away from all the distractions. And Lord, just listen to you. Let you speak to us through your word and through your spirit in our hearts and change us, Lord. I pray we would be a church full of people who walk with you. We thank you for these moments in Jesus' name. Amen.